Okay. I think we're, we have one minute. And so just, you know, that way we can do prayer now and then just move right on in. Well, one thing I did want to start with is that I had heard the sad news this week from Carolyn that Karen Dell had passed away. And I just wanted to acknowledge that before I start. I know that there are some of you on this call that were very, very close to her. And I had the joy of knowing her for many years and being touched by her in many different ways over the years. And I just, mm -hmm. I just wanted to acknowledge I'm sharing your sorrow. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. We're all grieving this together. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for saying that. Let's pray together. God, we bring you our heartaches and our hopes at the beginning of this new year. It's been such a hard year. And we do have hope that there will be some breath of new life in these months to come and that our suffering is going to diminish and that there are going to be ways that we will experience uh, restoration of relationship and, and ways of life that we had before that we've been far away from for a long time. But Lord, we're still in the midst of it very, very much so. And so there's just um, a, so many ways that we need you, God. So even as we start this time together, as we're going to reflect on a passage of scripture together and look for you, look for your ways that your Holy Spirit will take our story and weave it in with this story in ways that will be meaningful and help us to learn how to have hope, how to persevere and how to love in deeper and more authentic ways. We pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I'm in my husband's office and I don't see Kleenex. Men don't have Kleenex as often. That's not true. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> that was sexist. Okay, I wanted to start with an acknowledgement that January 6th, um, January 6th was the Feast of Epiphany. And I don't know whether that was something that many of you acknowledged or... Um, we did, we did. We uh, celebrated Epiphany in worship last Sunday. Oh, wonderful. Well, I, I, love, I love the word epiphany. I love the idea that somehow in the same way that epiphany is celebrating the manifestation of Christ in the world, the breaking in of God in the world, that when we have an epiphany, somehow something divine breaks into our mind, a thought, a reflection, an experience where we, we feel aware of God's presence, God's divine inspiration a little bit closer than we normally do. One of the things that I learned as I was um, reading about Epiphany this year is that in many uh, traditions, uh, Epiphany is accompanied with a blessing of the house. It's kind of, I think, a way of connecting to the fact that the wise men came to the house, so to speak, of Mary and Joseph to bless and worship, that we bless our houses on January 6th beginning of a new year and a celebrating of epiphany and someone that I love a lot an artist and author Jan Richardson has written an epiphany blessing and she frames it as she also was looking at this connection of blessing a house and epiphany that what if we even think of this new year that we're coming into 2021 as a house that we're going to actually be living in this year we're going to be dwelling and walking around in this year and even just trying to imagine the way we'd bless a house that we could begin to bless this year of 2021 like we, like we would a house. So I'm gonna read you her epiphany blessing as we begin today. Think of the year as a house, door flung wide and welcome, threshold swept and waiting, a graced spaciousness opening and offering itself to you. Let it be blessed in every room. Let it be hallowed in every corner. Let every nook be a refuge and every object set to holy use. Let it be here in this year, in this house, that safety will rest. Let it be here that health will make its home. 
Let it be here that peace will show its face. Let it be here that love will find its way. Here, here, let the weary come. Let the aching come. Let the lost come. Let the sorrowing come. Here, let them find their rest. Let them find their soothing. Let them find their place and let them find their delight. And may it be in this house of a year that the seasons will spin in beauty and may it be in these turning days that time will spiral with joy. And may it be that its rooms will fill with ordinary grace and light spill from every window to welcome the stranger home. So that's Jan Richardson's blessing for this year to be a home where people will feel welcome, where there'll be a refuge. I need that. I'm, I'm feeling, uh, I was telling Laura as we started, I, I'm feeling a weariness in my bones that I don't think I've ever felt before. And I'm needing that hope and encouragement myself as well. Well, I'm very excited about the time we're gonna to spend together this morning with this parable. And I think that, that what I'd like to do different than last time and I actually, I think Carolyn had asked me to do this last time and I messed up, but what we're gonna do is if you have questions or comments, rather than have people unmute themselves and talk, we're gonna put them in the chat. And at the end, we're gonna have time and I will read questions from the chat that we can talk about together. So if there's something, even as I'm talking that stirs up comment, or a reflection, just please put that right into the chat and I will make sure and be checking that before, before we finish. But I'm, I love this parable. This is one of my favorite parables, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And I love parables in general because I really hate religious language. I don't like religious language. And I, I find it off-putting and I find that I don't really know sometimes what people mean when they use certain religious terms, different people mean different things. It feels sometimes very stiff to me. And what I love about parables is Jesus talking about very, very deep, mysterious spiritual things and incredibly earthy words. And it just, that feels like the kind of faith I want to experience and I want to be able to talk about things about seeds and soil. And the other part about parables that's so meaningful to me, because I always love everywhere I can notice what a feminist Jesus was, that the earthy things he talks about are not just men's earthy things. It's not just farming, but it's also baking and sweeping. And many of you, I know you know that, that women were not educated at that time. Women definitely would not be educated in spiritual things. So Jesus talking about deep spiritual things and language that would connect with the lives of everyday women is also very, very meaningful to me. So I love parables. And the parable that we're going to look at is in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. So I'm going to read that for you now, Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Jesus told them another parable, and in other translations, it says Jesus set before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus puts this parable before them right after he has spoken the parable of the sower and the seed. And right before he tells the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven and the bread. 
And a lot of biblical scholars point out that at this time in Jesus's ministry, this was the time it was, it was a real turning point where many people began leaving. There was increasing hostility. His initial enormous popularity was beginning to wane. Um, there was a sense that his message was not what people had been hoping or expecting to hear. And so it was a, a kind of a turn point, kind of turning towards, towards Jerusalem. And it's interesting when you think about these parables of the sower and the seed, where there are three soils that do not receive the seed. Only one of the four receives the seed. This parable of the weeds and the wheat, the parable of the leaven, the tiny leaven in the bread and the tiny mustard seed. There's a theme here that small things, God works with small things. And God often doesn't work in ways that are enormous and magnificent, but the power of something small to make an enormous impact. I think the part of these parables too, is as he's saying, you know, as you follow me and you follow this way of life that I'm going to be talking about, it's actually going to be offensive to many people. Jesus was offensive to people. And we're going to see in this parable, I think, one of the main reasons why. Um, and it can be discouraging, I think, at times for those of us, you wouldn't be here at 830 on a Sunday morning if there wasn't something in you that deeply values the community of faith of Brentwood Press and your own life with God. But it's discouraging, I think, to many people often that the life of the church is something that's in great decline right now. Um, a recent poll by the Barna Group said that only 30% of the world's Christians now live in the West. We're in very much a post-Christian time in our history, and there's not a lot of interest even at times in things of faith. And so, yet I think in these parables, what we're going to see is to not let the small be mistaken for insignificant and for something that's not powerful. What's not popular doesn't mean that there's not an enormous power of the small that God is using to bring love and hope and his message into the world. So this parable begins with a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his servants were sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And it's interesting that in ancient Palestine, there was actually a form of kind of bioterrorism where a competitive farmer would come and sow a weed. And it's a weed that even today is called the twin, the evil twin of wheat. It's called Darnel, D-A-R-N-E-L. And what would happen is the enemy farmer would hope that this Darnel would grow up and choke the life out of the wheat, that the weeds would overwhelm the wheat. So in this parable, when the plants come up and the weeds appear also, the servants go to the master and say, where did these weeds come from? Didn't you only sow good seed in your field? And what this really is, isn't it, is a way of addressing the problem of evil. God, why, if your plan is to bring your love and your kingdom in this world, why is there so much evil? Why is there so much hurt? Where did all these weeds come from? If you only sowed good things, where does this come from? And I think it's probably the most frequently asked question in the church. If God's powerful and God's loving, why do things look so bleak? God, where are you? And even what many people feel, some people are even taught this, is that actually some of the evil is there to teach people a lesson. Katrina was a response to the evil of the city of New Orleans. Or someone might get cancer because of something that they did earlier in their life that they did not repent of. And I think very, very clearly, one of the most important ways that this parable addresses that is when the servants say, where do these weeds come from? Didn't you only sow good seed? The answer is yes, God sows only good seed, that it was an enemy that came and did this. And this is something I, I looked forward to bringing up today, because I think it's an important thing for us to think about when you think about an enemy of God, an evil one. I mean, certainly at that time, Jesus and the early church believed very much 
and the evil one, there was the devil that was against the purposes of God. And that may not be something that you personally believe, but I do think it's something to ponder and consider. Do you feel that there's a reality to an evil force that is in some way at work, pulling people away from God, disrupting, you know, Scott Peck, I can't remember if I heard him at Brentwood Press or Westwood Press. Was he at Brentwood Press? Did Scott yes. Peck come? I think when I heard Scott Peck, psychiatrist who wrote a book called People of the Lie, speaking at Brentwood Press, and this book was written after years of being a psychiatrist, and he came to the conclusion that there, were, there was a type of evil that was more profound than human dysfunction. There was evil that he experienced in the lives of people that he worked with that was deeper and more profound than any diagnosis or any human frailty could capture. So I think it's interesting for us as people that are followers of God and that do put some value in scripture to think about where, where are you on that? What do you think about that? Do you feel that there's a force of evil that is at work in the world, mm -hmm. pulling people away from God, creating dissension? You know, I, I, I don't know if anyone wants to put anything in the chat. Definitely a part of the understanding of Jesus of the spiritual life. And what I think is important too, as we wrestle still even today with this idea of the problem of evil, to think about if you do not believe that there is an evil one at work in the world, thwarting the purposes of God, where, how do you, how do you understand the presence of the, of the evil that's around us? What is that? What does that mean to you? Where do you think that that comes from? Because really what I think this parable then leads us to look at is the evil that is within each one of us. That it's not just the evil that we see in other people, but what do we do with the parts of ourselves? And when I say evil, what I mean are just parts of us that, are, that turn away from love, parts of us that turn away from what we know, um, how we want to be. Why are we pulled so easily into those places that lead us away from God? We don't talk about this a lot in the Presbyterian Church, but I think it's a part of human nature, and it's a very deep logical question that deserves some reflection. So the naturally disciples then say, okay, here are these weeds. Someone came that, that you see the enemy sowed them, so should we pull them out? And another way of, of asking, how do we as Christians engage the evil in the world? Do we try to wipe it out? Do we try to eliminate all evil? Is that our job? And Jesus' answer is to coexist with evil rather than to try to eliminate it. I think this is the response that sums up one of the main reasons why Jesus was so offensive to so many. I mean, back then, the people of Israel were, were expecting Jesus to come and conquer the Roman oppression. And he didn't do that. And even in this statement now, I wonder what some of you think about that, to think of Jesus saying to us, no, it is not your job to eliminate evil. It is your job to coexist. Evil needs to be fought, but how we fight it makes all the difference. And there's something about this coexisting is a part of the way that Jesus wants to address evil in the world. Because think of, think of what the church has done in the name of trying to eliminate evil. We are, capable, we are incapable of doing good by violence without doing a great deal of evil ourselves. Think of the trauma and the tragedy of the Crusades, of the Inquisition, of the Salem witch trials, of so many ways that the church has thought it was their job to eliminate evil, and in so doing has perpetrated so much of it. Because I think the reality is we don't get to decide who is in and who's out. And I don't think that we have the wisdom and the discernment often to know that anyway. I, don't you think it's true that we often end up thinking that the ones that should be in look a lot like us? 
I mean, that that's just kind of a human nature. And so I think part of the wisdom of God of this parable is number one, don't get distracted by your loathing of evil. Don't get distracted by the amount and the presence of evil in the world. I think that so easily can become preoccupying to us. I know in my practice, I've had to often talk to people about how much news they're watching and to have as a part of uh, our treatment plan, a part of our ID to help with their mental health. Kind of news because of what it can do to their anxiety and their anger. We can get distracted by our loathing of evil. Solzhenitsyn said this once, I love this quote, if it were all so simple, if only there were evil somewhere in city deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Let them grow up together. I don't think this means that we just tolerate evil though and do nothing. The parable doesn't say that we sit on our hands. This parable is saying that the way that we respond has to be in line with love. That was really what we talked about last time I was here about what it means to love our enemies. That the way we respond to evil, we have to find a way to do that where we don't depart from love. So you think of the night when Jesus was betrayed and he's with Peter and Peter takes out his knife and cuts off the soldier's ear. What was Jesus's response to that? He picks up the ear of the person coming to arrest him and puts it back on and heals him. I think it comes back to that idea that in our self-righteousness, we can so often end up doing a different kind of evil. That was one thing I realized in a very personal way, you know, in my relationship with my mom, I was so angry at my mom for about 10 years for lots of things that I felt very legitimately enraged at her for. And what I recognized, what really helped me forgive her and move to a place of healing was that my competition in a way with her to be a better mother than she was, the arrogance I had of ways that I was always rehearsing her faults and my virtues and ways that I was, I couldn't let ways that she'd harmed me out of my mind. I'd rehearse them, kind of nurse them like a sore tooth in my mouth over and over and over. That that hatred, that arrogance, that self-righteousness was as horrible as anything my mom had done to me. And that, that part of me of putting myself above her as a better human being was really a byproduct of my deep hurt. It was just that I was so wounded and my hurt came out as self-righteous anger of you just And I think that's the part that I think Jesus is wanting us to really understand is that many times we get like the, if you think of the field of the wheat and the weeds, what happened was what? The disciples were afraid. They were afraid that the weeds were going to somehow take over the wheat. And I'm actual farming that happens sometimes. But in the kingdom of God, I think what Jesus is saying to the disciples and to us, the weeds are never going to take over the wheat. Let them grow together. The weeds are never going to be stronger than the wheat. And don't let yourself be preoccupied and distracted by removing the wheat, removing the weeds. I mean, focus on your own growth as wheat. Be glorious and golden and strong. Look to the sun and don't worry. The weeds will not overwhelm that. I think another important thing that comes to me in this parable is that not all weeds stay weeds, right? Sometimes if we think of a weed as something that was planted in your field that you didn't want, think of the things in your life that may have been, that, you, that may have popped up that you did not want. 
And in the kingdom of God, sometimes what starts as a weed doesn't always stay, but actually can become wheat. Again, I think about, I think about my divorce, not ever something that I would have wanted. But what I learned through the public sense of, in a sense, the, the public failure of a Christian pastor and psychologist who went through a divorce, how I saw how deep my people pleasing went, how I saw how deeply I thought that I should be able to live in a different way because of my education, that there was a, a freedom and a humility and an openness that came with the failure of my marriage that became an enormous gift of freedom to me, of accepting my faults, my limitations, not feeling like I had to be better than anybody else, and seeing also the way that my fears, what's going to happen to my practice if I'm divorced? What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to my ministry? Watching God restore, experiencing God's grace in ways through that very painful, something I would have never wanted in my field. There were ways that it was a weed and there are ways that it became some of the richest wheat that's fed my inner life more than anything else. And so sometimes what starts out perhaps as a weed is not always staying a weed. And think of even in scripture, how many stories of faithful people that end up failing and then being kind of communicated to again, you're mine, you're chosen. Nothing will disqualify you. Something else I was thinking about is that in the work of therapy, part of what I do is when I'm sitting with a person is I try to diagnose in one way or another what the problem is and then create a treatment plan to help a new type of behavior or freedom from some symptom that's plaguing them or suffering happen. So there's a diagnosis and a treatment plan and hopefully movement. In my training that I've had now as a spiritual director, it's a very different way of being with people. What you do instead is you create a safe space and you help them identify the truth of what's going on in their life, but you don't necessarily move them anywhere. You recognize that as a spiritual director, you're not sure what God might be doing with that challenge or stuck place or that pain. And you sit with them in that place of wherever it is, whatever's brought them to you as a spiritual director, it's usually a question of discernment or something that's difficult in their life, but it's not your job as a spiritual director to get them anywhere else. You don't move them anywhere. You trust the spirit of God. And sometimes the spirit of God's work in our life is a slow process, isn't it? Sometimes there's ways that God may have us hold something we don't wanna hold until it does its work on us that we have to sit in a place of difficulty at times because there's something that's being stirred up. There's something that's being addressed in us. There's something that's being healed in us that may take time. And it can be a very difficult place. It could be a weed in our field, something we absolutely don't want. Um, Sue Monk Kidd is an author I love to read. She wrote a book a long time ago called um, When the Heart Waits. And she writes about a time when she was watching a chrysalis form outside her window, her kitchen window. And it was just fascinated to watch the whole process. And as time went on and she began to see movement inside the chrysalis and even could actually see some of the form of the butterfly she was watching and just thought, you know, I think I'm just gonna get my nail, my tiny fingernail scissors and cut a tiny little incision to help that butterfly. Cause I can't wait to see this beautiful butterfly and there it is, it's ready, it's coming. And she said she just made the tiniest incision just to give the, that, that little guy in there a little help. But what happened is the butterfly fell out wet and not fully formed. And I don't know if butterflies need to work on their triceps, tendons or something, but anyway, that butterfly, even though it was struggling in the chrysalis, it was not ready to emerge. And her impatience caused the death of that butterfly because she couldn't wait. And I mean, we live in a Amazon same day delivery world, don't we? I mean, how many of you now are used to waiting for something to arrive in seven to 10 business days? On YouTube, research has been done that if 
something doesn't pop up, I think it's in two seconds, the person's gone. Like we, we I, I do think there's something in the spiritual life about a virtue of patience and waiting. Waiting as a marriage is healing, waiting as a child is finding his or her own legs. Right now um, in my home is my 32 year old son who is definitely a wanderer. He just um, finished his second master's in math and he's going to now rent a cabin in the um, Anzo Borrega area and create an herbarium of wildflowers for a few months before he looks for a teaching job. But I have to constantly be telling myself, look at the good in his life. Look at the beauty in the way he lives. Don't get impatient that he's 32 and doesn't have a job and doesn't have this and isn't there. And he, ever since he was little, he always wanted to walk more slowly than I wanted to walk. He's always been someone that said to me, mom, think of the most interesting people you know. Did their life go from point A to point B? Hello, I don't think so. And so I have to wait and be patient. And when I do, like just even this time, I feel so grateful that a talk with a good friend really helped me just release my need for him to start looking for teaching jobs now because, you know, for the fall, da, da, da. let him go press wildflowers. He just got done with a degree, he needs some time off. And I feel right now, enjoy him and communicate to him that your idea of renting a cabin for six weeks is a beautiful idea. You can be with yourself, you can be with nature and not be in a rush for where he's supposed to be at this time or that time. But it's not easy for me to get there. We're very eager to get to that butterfly stage. I think in this parable, because any parable that has to do with seeds and sowing, planting and growing is always slow work. Unless you're planting radishes for your fifth grade science fair that are supposed to grow up in like two weeks, but normal gardening and planting is slow work. And in the mysterious bigness of God, and in the slow work of God, good and evil coexist. And God, I believe part of it is God's always seeking to not just toss away what we might see as evil, but to redeem it. That's the heart of God. God wants all persons to be filled with God's grace and God's love. God doesn't want to relegate anybody off the map. And so that part of the nature of God in us to actually have hope that what, what might even look like a weed could actually be a place where God is at work that people we might see as evil are people that themselves are on a journey that may have another chapter in their lives where there's humility and redemption and tenderness and love. And so if we too quickly feel like we want to decide who we're gonna pluck out, not only would it damage our spiritual lives, but we would get it wrong. I think if people have been hurt a lot in the past, like the example I was giving with my mom, when we've been hurt, it's easy to focus on the weeds because I think we feel afraid. We don't want the weeds to hurt us anymore. We don't want to lose something. We, we get anxious and afraid that the presence of something that's not good is going to harm us. And I think that's the place where we need to be able to maybe lean more deeply into our trust that God, when God is with us, there is nothing that is going to be able to separate us from God's love. No challenge we go through, no difficulty is something where God can't permeate and be present in the midst of that. You know, I know, Carolyn, just even before the talk, you talking some about what you're walking through with Bill, that that's certainly something you never would have wanted, Bill didn't want, but there's ways that I know you experience God's grace and God's mercy and love through this experience of being a faithful friend and caregiver and spouse through these days, which is very difficult, but that God has blessed you and blessed Bill in different ways in that. So God's calling us to live into a bigger story that God has been and God is now and God will forever continue sowing good seed in the world. And when pandemics come and there is incredible political tension and people we love die and are ill, 
that there's not an absence of God. It's not that God did not do this and God did not leave. But this is the world we live in. There's in every, every marriage, in every church, in every person, in my own soul, there's this mixture of weeds and weed, of good and evil. That's who we are. That is the human condition. And we'll never be, we'll never be so holy as to get all of that outside of us and the world will never be that way. And this is what Jesus says, let them grow together. And I will sort things out. I will take out the weeds first and then bind together the wheat. What I want to do now is I want to look at some questions in the chat. And then I wanted to lead us on a spiritual practice. Well, before we finished of doing a time of exam and together where we can look, spend a little time reflecting on weeds and wheat that we're experiencing in our lives as we start this new year. And I think we have time to do a short 10 minute before we've got time for that. But let me look first in the chat. Um, okay, someone said, oh, Laura said, there's a lack of control with gardening. We can only do so much and the rest is up to nature and out of our hands. Exactly, that's such a great point, Laura. There is, isn't there still when you see a tiny black seed like such a mystery that that's going to actually become something beautiful that could actually feed me food. There's, I, I think that's a beautiful part of this parable as well as there's so much that is out of our control and that nature is, you know, God and nature are in control of. Um, here's one, it says, people of the lie is a good book and concept. The seed is the double entendre metaphor. For me, it seems that one metaphor is that the seed is the word. There's the word of God, the good seed, and the word of the liar. And you can always tell the difference between the two. Good is the fruit of the word of God, and evil is the fruit of the lie. So how do we fight lies? So I am kind of on the same page as you. Don't get distracted by the lie. Focus on the truth. God will sort it out later. Does anyone else have any other ideas of even disagreeing or having a different perspective of what we do? I mean, right now, just opening up any of the news emails you get, there is just so much that feels wrong. And what does it hit, how does that hit you today? Thinking with what you're dealing with today that Jesus says, let the wheat and the weeds grow together. Does that offend any of you or does that feel weak or too compromising or, too, I don't know, any thoughts? Anyone wanna put something in the chat about that? I'm interested if anyone has a different idea. Yeah. Kathy Harlan said, I can't resolve the fact that my faith in God is deep, but I'm still so afraid of our future. Evil people frighten me. Me too. I think evil people are frightening. And yet I think, what do we do with that? Do we allow that fear? I mean, isn't it interesting that there's so much in the Bible that perfect love casts out fear? There's something about love and fear that are in opposition, that there's something about being rooted and grounded in God's love, that it's not that there's not a reality of evil, but we don't have to be as afraid. You know, and it's interesting. I don't know for those of you that have had deep suffering in your life. I feel like my sister dying of alcoholism and going through the divorce have been my two most painful things I think I've been through but I actually think it's made me less afraid of suffering. That sometimes when we get, we go through suffering, we become less afraid of it. Like, I feel like I know more things are gonna happen to me. I'm 61 and I know that there's going to be many more losses of people I love and things that are gonna to happen to my own body. And like you're saying, Kathy, I feel very concerned about what's going to be happening in our future to our planet. I have a lot of things that I feel, but I don't feel as afraid, like I wanna go in a hole and hide from it. I feel more, God help us, God help us. How, what can I do? How can I do my part? How can I gather people around me that I'm gonna go through this with? I don't feel as afraid that it would destroy me. Here, someone else said, Martha said, there's such a freedom in receiving permission to coexist. I don't have to fix anyone or force change. I think that's so true, Martha. I think sometimes Christians have thought it's my job to change people. It's my job, it's my job to get them 
to see what I see. They're wrong. And I need them to see what's right. And yet there's violence done in that, isn't there? That we make assumptions that we're right and they're wrong. And so I think just knowing that's not our job, it's not our job to fix anyone or force change. It's such a challenge when people, this is Hibbert, there's such a challenge when people are convinced that lies are the truth. But see, here's where I think we've got to be honest though. My subjective sense of what is a lie is not what everybody else sees as a lie. And I know that can feel so hard, but I, I actually think that's part of what Jesus is saying is that I think we have to realize that all of us come to the truth with our own subjective, cultural, social framing and lens. And it's not that, it's not that we should say there is no truth, but how could we say that what I say is true is what's true for every other human being across all time? And all cultures. I think that's the part where we have to, you know, continue to say, I'm going to say this is these are my convictions and this is what I've come to believe. And I actually want to listen and be open to where I might be wrong. What what in the world is going to happen if we're not open to the fact that we might be wrong? Where does that leave us if we don't ever question our perspective? And we're so convinced that we are right and the other person is wrong. That's where I think intellectual and spiritual humility is so important. Here's something from Ivan. It says, God's admonition that we should not judge is surely more than a statement of supremacy, but also a loving protection from how bad we are judging. Also, this time-worn adage helps me remember that love is the only way frequently because this is hard, especially now. Resentment is like taking poison, waiting for others to die. It, it is so true. It is so true that, you know, again, going back to my very personal experience with my mom, what it feels like now to feel like God's helped me get to a place where she still hurts me. There's still things that she says and does that I feel pain, but I don't feel bitterness and resentment anymore. I've been able to let my mom be who she is. And I actually look for the ways that my mom has been wheat in my life and not just weeds, because there are ways that my mom has fed me good things and not just been a painful weed in my life. And the freedom that I feel that I can experience so much more joy rather than gnashing my teeth and just getting so upset. Um, I, I just, what I'd like to do now, if there's not, Another question, wait, here's another something. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We must do something, absolutely, but I don't think it's judge. I think that what we must do, number one, is live our lives with a kind of radical love and acceptance and power that is a <laughs> shining light. I think that's one of the things that we do for evil. And I think we also do work for justice, absolutely. But that's different than a kind of a harsh judgmental self-righteousness that I know who the evil ones are and I'm going to pluck them out. But you're right. Absolutely, Jesus does not want us to do nothing. But like I said before, but it's what we do and how we do it that makes all the difference. And we have to do what we do in addressing evil within a framework of love. That's why, again, going back to what I know I talked about last time, what I've learned from Father Boyle, Father Greg, is there is no us in them, there is only us. And that's not just a statement that's made towards us and gang members, that's us and people that disagree with us politically. There is no us in them, there is only us. And we have to learn somehow how to live together, how to respect each other, how to not attack and violate, or, or I don't think we're gonna be able to make it. A vet said, maybe to recognize that those who hurt us the most, who hurt those around them the most, are typically those who are suffering from the most pain and hurt in their own lives. God has recruited us to try to help the healing process for the pain in people's lives. I like that a lot. I really agree with that. I don't think a person who's healthy and feels secure wants to do a lot of violence. 
a person who's in a great place in their life and they're feeling loved and they're feeling confident and they feel valued and they feel significant. They want to lift others up. They want to listen to other people. They're curious. They want to be generous. That's what happens when a person's filled up with goodness and filled up with God's love. You, you wouldn't want to hurt anyone. Okay, well, let's try. We've got 15 minutes because we're going to stop at um, wait, one last one here from Linda. We have a great divide and a great difference in definition of the weeds. I have a group of friends who say things. They are made sick to their stomachs when people in government mention religion. Is that from old hurt, resistance to faith, but feels it's an indicator of potential repression of churches? I think I'm not going to get into that one. Um, I think, I think I, let, me, let me speak to maybe what I think the heart of it is. I think I'm glad that you have a group of friends who believe differently than you do. Because I actually think that's really important. I think if we are only around people that believe exactly as we do, we're missing out on a lot in life. And so I think that's a great thing, Linda, that you have those friends. I, again, I don't think that it's our job to talk people out of their beliefs. I think it's our job to live a kind of a life where God is so evident in the way we listen and the way we love and are caring about, caring about justice, caring about other people, that it's going to stir up. It's, it's something irrepressible. What you know when you're in the presence of someone like that, don't you? It is a powerful thing when you're in the presence of a person who's filled with God. So I guess I just think, I think we can get, this is, we can get distracted into debates and we can get distracted into trying to eliminate evil. And I think that's the meaning of this parable is don't let that distract you. Stay focused on what it means to be good soil and part of that is addressing justice, injustice, but do it in love. Do it in a way that's not judgmental and attacking and arrogant and creates more harm, more pain. More, it's, it's just evil for evil, evil returning evil. Okay, we're going to do this in about 10 minutes. And so what I'd like you each to do is to get comfortable where you're sitting and if you can, put your hands on your lap with your hands, your palms facing up in kind of a, a body posture of receiving. And just begin taking some big breaths. What I'd like you to do is when you're breathing in, to almost imagine that you're breathing in God's love. And you're breathing out fear and anxiety. And you're breathing in God's grace, breathing out judgment. And you're breathing in God's peace. And you're breathing out worry. God, thank you so much that you are present within each one of us and you're present between us. You're present in nature. You're present in music and art and good food. You're present whenever there's healing and reconciliation of a relationship. The birth of every baby. You're present with creativity and new ideas and hope. We thank you that you are at work in us from the moment we begin our lives to our very last breath. You are at work within us, inviting us many, many times every day to trust you to let you work in our lives, let you take root and dwell in our lives. 
you're at work helping us love and be more authentic and be more free. Thank you, God. And now, Lord, I pray that you will bring to each of our memory as we look back over this last year of 2020, Lord, what was the good seed that you sowed in our lives this last year? Where can your spirit help each one of us recall some memories of experiences of you, God, of good things? of joy, of hope. Help us now, Lord, just to sit for a minute and recall over these last hard months, places where you showed up, gifts you gave us. Lord, thank you for these gifts. Thank you that you will never stop, never stop reminding us that you are the giver of all good gifts. And we thank you for these reminders that your spirit has given each one of us of ways that you came close to us, ways you blessed us, ways we felt you near. And now, Lord, I pray that you'll allow us to remember times when we felt far away from you, times when we felt anxious or insecure or competitive, times when we have felt filled with rage. Lord, help us without condom any condemnation or shame to just remember times when our lives have felt ugly and small. Things we've said or not said. Lord, we thank you as well that we can remember these places where we've fallen short of love. And we can acknowledge that and lift that up to you and ask you to heal us and ask you to fill us and ask you to help us to do it differently. Lord, thank you that your forgiveness and your grace is there before we've even asked. Thank you that you run to meet us the minute we turn. And Lord, help us to learn from these weeds. Help us not to feel ashamed or embarrassed, but to be able to look at them and say, help me, what do you want to say to me through these places where I fall short of love? What hurt needs to be healed in me? What fear needs to be addressed in me? Help me, God. And now, Lord, as we look forward to 2021, I pray that your spirit will bring to mind the deep prayers of our hearts of what we long for, what we're worried about, what we need, what we need in our homes, what we need in our work, what we need in our life with you, God. Help us now in quiet, formulate our longings and our desires for this new year that we're just beginning. Lord, hear our prayers.
loving God, we, we thank you for the beauty of silence in your presence. And thank you that we don't understand prayer, but we believe that as we communicate our deep heart longings to you, that it matters and that you hear us and that you love us and that you come to us, not always in ways that we want, but you come to us. You are faithful, God. You hear our cries. You are touched by our hurts and you want us to be whole. You're at work constantly to bring healing and goodness and love and grace into our lives and into the world. So Lord, may we be a part of that. May we be more focused on goodness than evil. And may you show us how to address the evil in our, way, our world in ways that are loving. Show us how we can address injustice in ways that are in line with your spirit. We thank you for this time together and for one another. Thank you for your scripture that teaches us things. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that is guiding us always into the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Laura, it's 940. Um, I think we'll just end there, but let me say again, thank you. I, I love you people. I feel very connected to you and a part of your community of faith. So thank you for including me in 